Hello, listeners, and welcome back to another episode of Down a Rabbit Hole with your host, me, Cece Suarez. Thank you so much for coming back. Over the next few episodes, we're going to be discussing a pretty heavy topic, and that is family annihilators. The opinions expressed in this episode do not necessarily reflect those of the Down a Rabbit Hole podcast. Sensitive topics are discussed. Viewer discretion is advised. Familicide is a type of murder, or murder-suicide, in which the perpetrator kills multiple close family members in quick succession, most often children, relatives, spouses, siblings, or even parents. In half the cases, the killer lastly kills themselves in a murder-suicide. If only the parents are killed, the case may also be referred to as a parricide. Now, when all of the family members of a family are killed, the crime may be referred to as a family annihilation. Between 1900 and 2000, there were 909 victims of mass murder in the U.S., defined as four victims within a 24-hour period. Of those, more than half occurred within an immediate family. Although the familicide cases are relatively rare, they are the most common form of mass killings. However, statistical data is difficult to establish due to reporting discrepancies. Familicide differs from other forms of mass murder in that the murderer kills family members or loved ones rather than anonymous people. This has a different psychodynamic and psychiatric significance. But the distinction is not always made. A study of 30 cases in Ohio found that most of the killings were motivated by a parent's desire to stop their children's suffering. According to ABC News contributor and former FBI agent Brad Garrett, people responsible for killing their families tend to be white males in their 30s, which I feel like that could be a profile for every murderer, but I digress. Many of these crimes occur in August, before school starts, which may delay detection and investigation. In Australia, a study was done of seven cases of familicide followed by suicide, in which marital separation followed by custody and access disputes were identified as an issue. Some common factors, some common factors, such as marital discord, unhappiness, domestic violence, sexual abuse, threats of harm to self or others were found in varying degrees. It was not clear what could be done in terms of prevention. The internal logic for family annihilation can stem from a number of sources. David Wilson of Birmingham City University has divided these cases into four groups, anomic, disappointed, self-righteous, and paranoid. In this typology, the anomic killer sees his family purely as a status symbol. When his economic status collapses, he sees them as a surplus to requirements. The disappointed killer seeks to punish the family for not living up to their ideals and expectations of the perfect family life. The self-righteous killer destroys the family to exact revenge upon the mother in an act that he blames on her. And finally, the paranoid killer kills their family in what they imagine to be an attempt to protect them from something even worse. Now, as we go over each of these cases in the following weeks, I think it will be interesting to open up the conversation and discuss what type of killer do you think applies to each one of these cases. Now, I know it might be a surprise to you, but no, the Shanann Watts family murders is not the first one we're going to go over. And I know some people get a little bit weirded out when someone says this murder or this case or this phenomenon is is my favorite when it comes to true crime. However, if you don't get true crime, number one, why are you listening to this podcast? But two, I'm not meaning to glorify these actions or or fetishize any type of murder or horrific act that ever happened to anybody. Relationships, people's reasonings, and this type of psychological aspect of true crime does fascinate me as well as many others. And so that's what I always like to focus on in my podcast and in my YouTube content as well. If you're not following me on YouTube, feel free to. Again, we're just here to fall down a rabbit hole together. Now in today's episode, we will actually be going over John List. And I find this one very fascinating because this person was actually caught. He was on the run for quite a while. But this man was actually caught due to true crime lovers just like you and me. He was actually featured on America's Most Wanted, and someone in his community called in and said, hey, 
that looks like my neighbor. And that's how he was caught. Fun fact, when interviewed, he actually admitted that he was watching that episode of America's Most Wanted with his wife. He said that his wife didn't recognize him. It was an age-progressed clay bust that they were working off of and showing, but he said that it was clearly him. And, he, and I quote, I was sweating. John List successfully evaded the law for over 18 years. He was born in Bay City, Michigan. He was the only child of German-American parents, John Frederick List and Alma Barbara Florence List. Like his father, John was a devout Lutheran and a Sunday school teacher. He was described as an aloof, cold man with few friends, which is your first red flag. His mother, in particular, was very domineering and overprotective. Now, I'm not saying that all murdering men have mommy issues, but be nice to your sons is all I'm saying. In 1943, he enlisted in the United States Army and served as a laboratory technician during World War II. After his discharge in 1946, List enrolled in the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor, where he earned a bachelor's degree in business administration and a master's degree in accounting. He was also commissioned as a second lieutenant through the ROTC. In November 1950, as the Korean War escalated, List was recalled to active military service. At Fort Eustis, Virginia, this is where he met his wife, Helen. She was the widow of an infantry officer who was killed in action in Korea, and she lived nearby with her daughter, Brenda. John and Helen married on December 1st, 1951, in Baltimore, Maryland, and then the family moved to Northern California. After completing his second tour in 1952, List worked for an accounting firm in Detroit, and then as an audit supervisor at a paper company in Kalamazoo, where his three children were born. By 1959, List had risen to general supervisor of the company's accounting department, but Helen, an alcoholic, had become increasingly unstable. In 1960, Brenda, Helen's first daughter, married and left the household, and List moved with the remainder of his family to Rochester, New York, to take a job with Xerox. He eventually became director of accounting services, and in 1965, he accepted a position as vice president and comptroller at a bank in New Jersey. This is when he moved his wife, children, and his own mother into Breeze Knoll, a 19-room Victorian mansion at 431 Hillside Avenue in Westfield. Basically, they moved on up to the east side and finally got their piece of the pie. To their neighbors, they may have seemed normal, I'm doing air quotes there, but there was a lot going on inside that house. Reading from a police report, attorney Elijah Miller quoted William Presel, a friend of Patricia's, one of List's children. She believed in strange things. She believed in witchcraft. She told me she had an altar someplace. Former Westfield patrolman Robert Kenny, who investigated the case, wrote in a 1971 report that Patricia, quote, believed very strongly in witchcraft and felt that she was a witch herself, end quote. In other reports, Helen List was said to have been admitted to the hospital for using large amounts of barbiturates and tranquilizers, and some reports say that she was blind from syphilis, which she apparently caught from her first husband when he returned from the Korean War. She kept her diagnosis a secret from her family and doctors for years. Untreated syphilis can damage the brain, eyes, heart, nerves, bones, joints, and your liver, just to name a few things. You can also become paralyzed, blind, demented, and lose other feelings in your body. How vague is that? Just losing feelings in your body. Untreated syphilis can also lead to stillbirths or developmentally delayed babies. When I tell you that I was not expecting to go down a rabbit hole and do a side little deep dive on syphilis, I know far too much about syphilis now. Fun fact, did you know that syphilis can make your nose fall off? Did you also know that back in the day, a lot of prestigious people in England used to wear powdered wigs because they would have scalp sores and basically their head looked like Swiss cheese? So that's why they wore those powder wigs and then it just became a fashion statement because people thought, oh, those fancy people are wearing powdered wigs, let me wear it too. Little did they know, their scalps are looking like Swiss cheese because they have syphilis. Enough about STDs, that's not why you're here. In 1971, John List lost his job at the bank at age 46. Other job opportunities did not quite pan out for him, and he couldn't bear telling his family about his misfortune. So instead of coming clean and telling them about this or just 
trying harder to get a job, as he did so many times before, maybe even downsizing could have been a good option. But he could not bear being a, quote, failure. John List later said in an interview that he was brought up that you were supposed to be the caretaker for your family. You were supposed to be able to financially take care of them and give them the best. And if you didn't, you were an absolute failure. And failure is not an option. You know what else isn't an option? Murdering your entire family. But here we are. Instead of telling his family that he was currently unemployed, John spent his days at the train station. He would dress up for work and go sit at the train station like a true psychopath. And then he would come back home and pretend that he'd been at work all day. He would just sit there and read the newspaper, all while secretly skimming money off of his mother's bank accounts to pay the mortgage and basically just get by. He refused to go on welfare because, as he says, that would be very embarrassing to his family and violate the principles of self-sufficiency that he learned from his father. It's really hard to believe that the solution that he arrived at would have been more acceptable to his father. But John Liss would later say that it seemed to him that this was the only option, murdering his wife, mother, and all three of his children. On November 9th, 1971, John Liss shot and killed his wife, Helen, his 16-year-old daughter, Patricia, his 15-year-old son, John, and his 13-year-old son, Frederick, and his mother, Alma, who was 85 years old. They were each shot methodically, one by one. Helen first, Liss saw the children off to school, and then he shot her in the kitchen as she sipped on her morning coffee. Then he went up to the third floor, murdering his mother in her bed. After that, he moved on to Patricia, his 16-year-old daughter, when she returned home from school. Then the youngest son, Frederick. And then he took a break, made himself a sandwich, with the dead bodies of his family members surrounding him. He closed out his bank accounts. And then he went and watched his son, John, play soccer at school. And he gave him a ride home and then shot him in the chest. There are some reports that state that it seems as though John List had a little bit more trouble killing his son, John, the one that is named after him. Apparently, there were signs of a struggle, and that is why he ended up shooting him multiple times, and of course, the one in the chest killing him. I cannot imagine how terrifying that would have been for John Jr. as he came home from a soccer game to walk in and see his brother, his sister, and his mom only to realize that he's next. John List laid the bodies of his family members on top of sleeping bags in their big, empty ballroom. Then he composed a note to his pastor, who he felt would understand the situation. He feared that his family, confronted with a world full of evil and poverty, would turn from God, and that this was the only way to ensure their safe arrival into heaven. He was not, however, willing to suffer the earthly consequences of his actions. In an effort to confuse the police, he cleaned the crime scenes and used scissors to remove every image of him from the mansion. He canceled all deliveries and contacted his children's schools to let the teachers know that the family would be on a vacation for a few weeks. He turned on the lights and the radio, leaving religious hymns echoing throughout the house's empty rooms. He slept in the mansion where his family laid dead around him. Then he walked out the door the next morning and wasn't seen again for 18 long years. A full month passed before the neighbors even started getting curious about lights burning out, empty windows, and started suspecting that something was wrong. When the authorities entered the Westview, New Jersey house on December 7th, 1971, they heard organ music playing through the house's intercom system. They also found a five-page note from John List explaining that the bloodied bodies on the ballroom floor were his family members, killed out of mercy. He had saved their souls. The FBI found his car parked at Kennedy Airport in New York City, but they never found him. The trail went cold. Fast forward 18 years. Now we're in 1989. New Jersey prosecutors had to come up with a plan. They had an expert forensic artist, Frank Bender, create a physical bust of John List. As Bender imagined, he might have aged. Bender gave him a hawk nose, grizzled eyebrows, and horn-rimmed glasses. Psychologists theorized that List would wear the same spectacles he wore as a young man to remind him of more successful days. Not only that, but he would want to appear smarter and also be able to have that security 
security blanket, so to speak, and be able to hide behind something, even if it's just thick-rimmed glasses. When the very popular show, America's Most Wanted, aired the story on the John List murders on May 21st, 1989, an audience of 22 million saw Frank Bender's sculpture. Tips came pouring in. One tip from a woman in Richmond, Virginia, who thought her next-door neighbor, Robert Clark, bore a striking resemblance to the bus. The tipster said that her neighbor was also an accountant and attended church. Authorities went to Clark's home and spoke to his wife, whom he'd met at church at a social gathering. Her story put an end to the 18-year-long mystery. It turned out that Liss had changed his identity and moved to Colorado under the assumed name Robert Clark. The alias worked, and he kept it and moved to Virginia, just a few states away from where he had previously murdered his entire family. Police in Virginia arrested the mass murderer, John List, on June 1st, 1989, only nine days after America's Most Wanted aired that episode. At his trial in 1990, defense lawyers argued that List suffered from PTSD from his military service in World War II and in the Korean War as well. Expert psychologists believed, rather, that List was going through a midlife crisis. And as the prosecution pointed out, there was no excuse for killing five innocent people. The jury finally found John List guilty, and the judge sentenced him to five life terms. In an interview with Connie Chung in 2002, List said that he didn't kill himself after killing his own family because he felt that would prevent him from getting into heaven. All List wanted was to reunite with his wife, mother, and his children in the afterlife, where he believed there would be no pain and suffering. John List died in prison in 2008 at the age of 82. Now, just a few points that I find extremely interesting. The the mansion where he murdered his entire family burned down in 1972, and it was discovered only after that that the stained glass skylight that was over the ballroom was made by Louis Comfort Tiffany. I'm probably butchering that name. I'm sorry. And it was worth an estimated $100,000. The irony of that, that he could have sold the house or maybe just the skylight instead of murdering his entire family. And that $100,000 skylight was what was over his dead family. John Liss also stated in an interview that he originally planned to kill his family on November 1st, 1971, because it was, quote, All Saints Day, the day after Halloween, a day he thought appropriate for sending them to heaven. However, due to an interruption in his travel plans, he delayed the killings until eight days later on November 9th. I feel when we get to heaven, we won't worry about these earthly things. They'll either have forgiven me or won't realize, you know, what happened, John Liss told downtown's Connie Chung in an interview at the New Jersey State Prison in Trenton. He continued and said, I'm sure that if we recognize each other, that we'll like each other's company just as we did here when times were better. When times were better, meaning before he lost his job, refused to go on, refused to go on welfare, and of course, before he murdered his entire family. John Liss remained deeply religious even up until his death. He acknowledged that his crimes did violate one of the Ten Commandments, thou shall not kill, but he said, I knew it was wrong as I was doing it. I knew it was wrong. But during a four-hour interview, he sought to explain how worries that financial hardship would split his family and turn them away from their faith, and that forced him to make this hard decision. I finally decided the only way to save them from that was to kill them, he said. Now, one quote that I want to leave you with from John List, which I truly think is just horrifying, is from that same 2002 Connie Chung interview. And it says, after making the decision, List says, there was no turning back. It's just like D-Day. You go in, there's no stopping you after that, he said. Now, as I stated at the beginning of this episode, I want to discuss the typology. What type of family annihilator killer do you think that John List is? Is he the disappointed killer, the self-righteous, the paranoid, or the anomic? I'd say it's pretty clear to say that he would be the paranoid killer, the one that annihilates their family in order to protect them from something even worse, which in this case would have been embarrassment, financial ruin, even though John List himself caused these things. A 
I hope y'all enjoyed this episode of Down a Rabbit Hole with Cece Suarez. That's me. If you did, be sure to go rate and review over on Spotify. They have a little rating system as well now. And then also on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts. Listen, even if you listen to the podcast on YouTube or Spotify or Apple, anywhere you listen to it, please be sure to go rate and review on the other platforms as well. That helps me so much and I appreciate you immensely. If you would like to support the podcast, other than just rating and reviewing and subscribing, feel free to become a channel member of the YouTube channel. That is CC Suarez over on YouTube. Thank you so much to the current channel members for really making this podcast happen. I could not do it without you. The Down a Rabbit Hole podcast is produced by Chelsea Suarez, Wiggum Suarez, and Tony Suarez. All episodes are written and researched by Chelsea Suarez and Tony Suarez as well. Again, thank you to our channel members for making this happen. We really do appreciate the support. We will see you next time on another episode of Down a Rabbit Hole.